CataractCoach.com, podcast number five, surgical learning and coaching, making you a better surgeon. So today we have two great guests. Our first one is Dr. Anuradha Khanna. She's professor and vice chair of education at Loyola University in Chicago, and she's going to teach us about learning. What's the best way to actually learn surgery, and how can your professors do a better job of teaching you surgery. And I think you'll be surprised. There's a lot of great information, and I learned a lot. And then next we have Dr. Sarah Bozorg, who's in private practice in Maine, in the New England part of the USA. And she's going to teach us about coaching and what does it mean to have a coach. Professional athletes have coaches, and it helps them perform better. Do you need a coach? Can you coach yourself? What are the barriers to it? Anyway, a tremendous amount of great information. I think you'll really enjoy this podcast, so check it out. And remember, we're also on Apple, Google, Amazon, Spotify, wherever you like to get your podcast from. Check it out, download it so you can listen when you're working out or driving to work, and I think you'll really enjoy these. We have a lot of great podcasts coming in the very near future. CataractCoach.com, we have a discussion here. There was a video yesterday, video number 1720, where I asked... My viewers for help from an email that I received. I received many emails like this, which is a young surgeon training who says, should I give up operating? And we have here an expert in the field, Dr. Anu Khanna, who has decades of experience in teaching residents and fellows. And we decided to discuss this topic a little bit more. That video generated a tremendous amount of views and a ton of comments as well. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So what did you think of the video and what do you think of that, con- that, that topic that must come up sometimes in your, in your own academic life? Actually, it's an extremely important topic that I think most of the times people shy away from discussing openly. It is more common than you think that the, the, it, it, like, uh, young ophthalmologists come to this point in their career way more often than we realize. So I think it's extremely important that we look at it from multiple perspectives. And I am not surprised that you got so many views and so many comments. So very important well, this topic. What, per, what percent of young doctors in training, residents and fellows, what percent do you think feel this way from time to time? Is it a 5%, 10, 20, 50%? What do you think I'm so? taking a wild guess, so maybe about 15%. 15, so like maybe one in six, one in seven. Yes. And in, do, what, in your experience, what's the ex, uh, percent of, one, of those people who feel this frustration who eventually end up dropping out or switching or not operating? Maybe 2%. Oh, so then that's good news. So then the vast majority of people, if you have these doubts or you have these hurdles that you're trying to overcome, be persistent, be tenacious, hang in there, you're going to do fine. Yes. And this is where I think we have to deconstruct, like what does it take to go from being a novice to a master surgeon? So- Oh, well, I, that's a tough topic. Give me your insight. So is it fair for me to say that be it a master surgeon or a athlete or a musician in their peak performance, they are in what they describe as in the zone or yes. in a flow state. State of flow. You got it. Right. I had a video. I had a video on that in the past. Being in the state of flow. You got it. Okay. So, what is there are three components of that flow state. Okay. One is it has to be intense focus. Okay. Total engagement. Yes. And number three is. Um, uh, I, I have to think about this. It's like not feeling in control. It's like the stress level has to be really, really low. So these three. So total engagement, uh, in, uh, because if it's the task is too easy, you'll get bored. If oh, the for task sure. You're not is, engaged in it. Yeah, yes. Sure. If the task is extremely tough, then you'll get frustrated. So it has uh. to be the perfect amount of stress. So I always call it, there has to be a, balance between parasympathetic and sympathetic. Oh, that makes sense for sure. Right? So 
that that is one component and that is where it is not dependent wholly solely on the learner it's also dependent on the educator and in fact the entire team this is where we call we have to create a safe environment so this flow state is where we, this is our ultimate goal this is how we have to teach them and it does take a long period of time so it's a skill it's not an inborn talent it's a skill how can we be better teachers so for that i think what we need to focus on is how do we learn like these are adult learners mm mm-hmm. and then not only that how do we learn in high stakes situations these are high risk sure situations patient safety is of utmost importance so given all that how do we learn so this is where i personally learned from the work of angela duckworth she's a psychologist okay at uh u pen i think and she has done some work on this she studied um west point cadets she studied um students who uh kids who participate in spelling bee like the ones who go how far do they go sure, and sure, she studied sure. salesmen like how and her focus was to see who perseveres through and who drops out like what are their characteristics and what she find out that sounds so, like a great topic i know so it was it was not iq it was not social intelligence it was it was good. grit yes you got it it grit, was tenacity it was grit so then she how do you define so can you grow grit that's the question you get asked a lot i get asked a lot can you grow grit i don't know what is the answer okay. i'm not so I'm not sure i i decided to see how does angela duckworth define grit okay okay maybe um i should probably tell you that i'll read what she actually says she says grit is the tendency to sustain interest in and effort toward very long term goals so if you deconstruct okay. it there is you have to have a sustained interest sustained sure. effort and clear long term goals so and these are long term so it's it's not you know a residency program is a set amount of time but this is long term so the goal so is very many 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 years and not just like 3 years or 4 yes, years yes yes so how do you define interest so for interest i dug into carol dweck's work she is also a psychologist at stanford okay. university she defines something called a growth mindset okay and i personally understand growth growth mindset better when we see how does it compare with fixed mindset mm-hmm. so fixed mindset folks they think you are either smart or you're not okay okay the growth mindset person will say genius can be made ah but very very important difference yes so next like a fixed mindset person will shy away from challenges because they okay. don't want to fail and look bad whereas someone with growth mindset will say they will want to they will embrace challenge they know that they can learn from obstacles sure so that is a big difference and also the compa- you know how sometimes we compare who's a good surgeon who's a bad surgeon sure of a person with a fixed mindset will think of that as either i'm good or i'm bad whereas a person w- with a growth mindset will say hey i'm not going to be jealous i'm going to learn from these those who are better surgeons who are better i like it so for me yeah, for me i say the same thing i say that for my residents when i was teaching i retired last year but i said success and failure are both along the same path of of your journey they're both in the same direction a little bit of a failure is no big deal it actually propels you further yes. so on the road on the on the, your journey to success failures are normal that's what propels you exactly that's what makes you 
learn something sure beyond your comfort zone something that you already know sure so i think and, and once again this growth mindset has to be adopted as a culture in the program in our, i i would rather say it needs to be a culture in the entire ophthalmology community wow okay it has it is this has to come from top down it cannot just be the learner because carol dweck says that adopt the attitude of instead of saying good bad pass fail say not there yet got it are, that makes sense yeah i'm not there yet they are not there yet we are not there yet something like that so can i can i ask a contrary uh, opinion so there were many many comments that were there a lot of them were anonymous and one of the anonymous comments said perhaps we should be checking for stereopsis in 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 our in our applicants for residency we should be checking for manual dexterity or sh should we not that is something that actually i have come across during my journey okay it is a disservice to the students if we don't tell them early on as soon as they enter medical school they should be told what are the certain uh, physical requirements for different specialties let them test it out let them try it out it's going to be very non-judgmental and it will not have such dire consequences as it would after they've spent four three years or four, four years, years five yeah in residency exactly. but, but here's the here's the problem we, we've both seen this i mean i've trained more than 200 residents and the truth of the matter is there are some residents who just don't have the coordination to be top tier I mean, there is like everything else in life. There is a bell curve distribution, a Gaussian distribution, and so my 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 question here is, shouldn't we be checking for this? In the old days, you people may not know this, but twenty five years ago, thirty years ago, ENT programs, ear, nose, throat, otorhinolaryngology would check with soap carvings. They'd give you a bar of soap at your interview, and you have to carve the soap in front of them. Some programs, even in ophthalmology now, um, I believe it was Southwestern, maybe it's uh, my, but some Texas program was checking applicants stereopsis just to make sure you have appropriate depth perception but what do we do when we have a situation where you've got someone who has great grades because we're emphasizing your grades of actually med school's not even graded anymore right but we're emphasizing some academic things but not checking the other aspects of it do you have the the grit do you have the tenacity do you have the dexterity do you have the drive and determination to actually achieve this i think once again i think we have to go back to the early years this is a conversation that needs to be had at the medical school level okay it's too late by the time they come to us but on the other hand other than something like lack of stereopsis i would like to challenge the educators that change the, there are methods the athletes they don't only just practice on their court say for basketball they also go and do exercises for muscle I, of, I, I, of course of course so, of course they do they put up plenty of time but listen we've all had residents who don't want to go to the wet lab they come to the operating room with a blank slate like okay i'm here teach on me they've done no preparation ahead of time you've had a, you've had a resident come to the operating room with you even a senior resident who really can't suture that well with 10 on nylon well, what do we do now? So I look at it as if a resident cannot do it, where did I fail as an educator? So it and it has taken me decades to come to this point. But maybe that's maybe that's and I'm just giving you the contrary opinion here. Maybe that's enabling to their problems. No, so I, they don't have to take responsibility for their own life. You can't always be there sitting next to them. They're going to have to graduate and be on their own. So this is where I have given it a lot of thought and I think these are smart st learners. They made it this far. So, and with these 
the, the motivation, the inspiration, the engagement but it's a part. Di- it's a di- but it's a different kind of learning. To be a devil's advocate here, there, everything we do up until co- high school, college, medical school, it's all academic, academic. Yes. Read this material, regurgitate it, take this test. Yes. And it has nothing to do with the other aspects of being a surgeon, which are arguably more important. So I'll tell you what we've done at our program. Sure. And it is these kind of conversations that we, the discussions that we are having. Sure. I have always challenged myself as an educator. And so the um, outcome of that, this is what it has been. I, so I, I tell them that, so they're all eager to learn as PGY2s. Okay. Right? Not the internship. As PGY2s, I do something, I call it fake fun for them. Literally, okay. I take fruits and vegetables, and for every step of the cataract surgery, I have something that I make them do with kitchen utensils and fruits and vegetables. You okay. should see the fun and laughter, and if the, I would think it was only for the PGY2s, but the upperclassmen also want to come and be part of it because they want to teach and they want to be part of that fun. So that sets the tone of, okay, there's, it, it's more of a relaxed situation and they understand the fundamentals. Like I will let them flounder. I will not give them the step one, step two, step three. For example, slice this tomato. But you, you, have, you can't use your, you can't touch the tomato with your fingers. You have to use instruments. That's going to be only if they're not doing it, they're struggling. Sure. So you show them that you have to stabilize the structure first and then the, the instrument will work. This is just one example. So sure. from there on and the discussion starts between different classes, like how do we do it? Why do we do it? And with the, without them knowing, they're learning certain things. Then the second thing I do is that they come to the OR as PGY2s. So Fantastic. So they early have, exposure. They have no responsibility other than they have to be. So they come early in the morning. The initiative is it has it has to come from them. They have okay. to show up for the first case. And they the senior residents also know that they, they have no other responsibility other than just showing up first. And I'll have them help the scrub tech sure like they do all the let let them work on it a couple times sure 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 of course then they fold the lens and i let them inject the lens oh okay so it's so similar once i feel they are so okay, step step a stepwise approach that's all they do that time they are not stressed seen and senior is not stressed senior does get stressed because they get a taste of what it is to let someone else sit yeah and do something so now For sure. they start respecting the educator. They get start to hear, they, they want to participate in teaching. And then they see what, the, how the, the senior attending is doing it. So it's a, it has been very successful. We've been doing it for several years now. And the PGY2s, they show up. And by the end of the, that year, they... I don't let them start, but they finish their access. That makes sense. Do you see how I'm splitting it into smaller, yeah, smaller you're, parts? You're just, yeah, just little, little bites at a time, manageable bites, instead yes. of like, here's the whole case. Yes, and they don't even know that in the whole process in the beginning, they've learned how to use the microscope, the hand-eye coordination. That's fantastic. I love your approach. I think it's a great, I should have trained there at Loyola with you. It would have been so, so well, much less stressful. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you, you, but you do, is 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 like the next step now where the 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 cataract surgery it has the i i break it down into hard skills and soft skills okay so the hard skills are where we are getting into the eye telling them the nitty gritty of how to hold the instruments and what to do when you're in the the what if right sure they are learning the what if sure. because they're not getting that we have an apprenticeship model. Every sure, student, every learner gets different types of patients that they operate on. So to 
prepare them. It, what, what you are doing is you are creating adaptive learners, but I'll, I can talk about that later. First, let's finish our grit because we talked okay. about the, the interest. We still have to talk about the effort, like what kind of effort, and that's probably where you were leading me to sure. talk about. So effort, say somebody has 20 years of experience. Is it, okay. is it one year repeated 20 times? That's, so that, not, as, not as beneficial as evolving and yes. progressing, of course. And you've heard about the 10,000-hour the 10, yeah, 10, rule. So sure, Andre, Mal Malcolm yes. Gladwell's kind of idea. Yes, so Andre Erickson, he's another psychologist who, um, who has done this work. Um, pretty, his research has... It's, it's very well laid out. So what he says is, okay, so this repeating the same thing again and again, that's sure. naive practice. Then what is purposeful practice? Purposeful practice, the elements of that are intense focus. Okay. Uh, I, it has to be... Progressive challenges. Like a specific goal. Specific right. goal, intense focus, immediate feedback. But it has to be only as... like it. Remember the flow state? You cannot sure. be in a self-reflective situation. That's not the time to worry about of course. things. So of just course. enough uh, feedback. And then... Don't, don't worry, the eye gives great feedback during cataract surgery. Yes. One wrong move, there goes your capsule, now you learned. <laughs> yes. And then... The, Instant feedback. <laughs> exactly. And the fourth component is pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone. Sure. Those are the failures and the obstacles you were talking about. Of and course. So that is purposeful practice. But then here comes another element. If there is a coach, then it becomes deliberate practice. Mm, that makes sense. So what you are doing is you are providing them that element. So in sure. other words, if someone were to learn to do something, they'll make 10 mistakes, 10, things will, 10 times things will go wrong for 10 different patients, then they will learn versus sure. as a coach, you can limit that. You can limit the amount of in in the in the operating. Get, get them on yeah. Get them on target faster. Exactly. This is where once again the educator can control the environment in the room. They can control you. You have to let them. You have to give them time to think, at the appropriate time, not as PGY twos, of, but of as course, seniors. Once you know that, okay, they have the steps, they, they can do things safely, but the mo you stop them bef right before they do something bad. But as- makes, Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Right, so that's where the coaching, so I, we think of ourselves as coaches. That, that's a better way of doing it. So that's the kind, so now we know how to grow grit, growth mindset, we need deliberate practice and a long-term goal so well you've done an amazing job I mean I'm a as you know I'm a big fan of your program your whole department yeah, is kind you. of on board with this mentality and I think it's a it's a true success model we should document it delineate it specifically and spread it out to other residency programs I think it'd be very beneficial happy to share it and the uh, residents are the ones who see how beneficial it is and sure. they are the ones that like each class tells the the junior class you better show up <laughs> i don't have to say anything or do anything and you should so it's, it's, it's a culture within the whole department i love it that's that's fantastic it's the best way yeah that's what i said that this growth mindset and being um, adopting newer techniques and the cohesive way as uh, teamwork Credit goes to the entire faculty and, of course, to our chair, Dr. Bouchard. So, yeah, fantastic. Well, I want to thank you. This has been very helpful for me to kind of digest these topics. And I think, yeah, you're right. And the concept of should a young doctor give up operating, I think the question is what you brought up. Have they been in an appropriate environment that helps them learn? And so that's, that's really the important other side of the coin that sometimes we're not considering. Yes. It, oh, fantastic. It's one of those things that we can 
change so the the learners can he, they can relax if i tell them skills can be learned sure and you tell them give them a methodology the 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 psychology behind it and uh as far as the educators this also tells them it's not just all about knowing the steps of the cataract surgery there is more to it that they can contribute they, they are all doing it they are all already doing it i like one being, of, being a, being a great surgeon doesn't make you a great teacher yes is the difference yes so and sometimes you do things intuitively so knowing what you are doing is important i i was it's a it's, i'll tell you a short story it's a it's actually my personal experience so when i was a young attending like i started getting teacher of the year awards i can see why okay so the third year when i got it i remember dr bushard handed me the certificate and then he turns around and says okay from now on she is disqualified from any other any more awards hey that happened to me too look those are my awards up here 1 2 3 4 5 i'm not allowed to get them anymore so well so then he says then he turns back to me and says and you please figure out what are you doing so we can teach other all like educating sure. the educators that's where it came from of course and i thought oh i that should be easy but no no that's a tough that's a challenge that was and ed- educating the educators is not easy that's that's in fact where we first met exactly exactly so i knew and aupo is has a one full day for educating the educators so a lot of work has is being done and i feel that um we have come a long ways from yeah when we started the journey so i i think there and it's going to keep going it's not going to end here so i think there's a lot we can do that's fantastic well what would you give us as a final summary here so your take on this is tell me a great environment we've got to educate the educators yes we got so, to teach grit what's your take what's your take home message take home message is it's not su- surgical skill is not a inborn talent it can be learned it can be taught and it has to be a culture in the entire ophthalmology community it cannot be done by a single learner a single educator it has to be a group effort that's fantastic fantastic well i really enjoyed our conversation i'm going to get this up on cataract coach for our viewers to enjoy as well and so they can learn from it and then i look forward to seeing you later this year at your annual loyola meeting can't wait And, and thank you for not host, inviting me to come to Chicago in January. I'm a California <laughs> guy. I can't take that cold. <laughs> no, we, we look forward to your. Uh, the residents are already. They're so excited that the. That oh, the, that's fantastic! We'll have a great you. time, and and I intend to. I want to kind of learn and enjoy your environment that you've created there, your culture, and maybe uh, steal a little bit of that, get some you know fresh ideas, and uh, apply it from our worldwide teachings on cataract coach. Absolutely, it'll be an honor. All right, Dr. Kanda, thank you so much. Thank you. And now for a discussion with Dr. Sarah Bozorg. She has an interest in making a short film about coaching in the surgical space. Can surgeons benefit from coaching the same way that athletes do? I mean, think, even the most professional athletes, they always have coaches, no matter how good that athlete becomes. And so the question is, can we apply those same principles or take home messages to ophthalmic surgery? can we keep pushing ourselves to be better and better surgeons and i think you'll really learn a lot from a great discussion check it out can take you to that next level or do you need a coach like does serena williams need a coach but you kind of do for some but what why i'm so i'm trying to figure out what is the you bring up a great point and that great point is even the greats like roger federer has a coach and his coach helps him become an even better version of himself. 
Now, technically, if the coach and Federer played each other one-on-one, -on -one, Federer's going to win. But it takes someone from the outside to take a step back and see it from a bigger picture to say, hey, here are a couple of points you may want to do may to make a few changes here, and that may improve your game. So having that coaching helps. Like, I'm a lifelong workout, lifting weights kind of guy, but if I have a trainer one day, that day I work out much better. Right, the trainer like it helps propel you to the next level. So having that coach, someone in your corner, really makes a huge difference. And I think we can apply those same principles, as you point out so eloquently, to surgery. And, right, and, the, and the coach you have for surgery doesn't necessarily have to be there in the operating room sitting next to you, but rather you have to be in the back of your mind, in your ear, or maybe sitting on your shoulder. And so when, when yeah. Federer plays his game, yes, coach is on the sidelines, but he's, the coach isn't actively talking to Federer. Federer is just recalling the things that were picked up or learned. Yeah, so that's exactly what I'm trying to like figure out with the coaching and what is it that a coach can bring to bring you to, you know, the, the next level. Um, and let, and so what are those things that a coach would be telling you? Yeah. So I think one of the important things that a coach does is gets us a little out of our head. It's kind of the way human nature is first. We all, all of us at some point in our careers, in fact, more than we want to admit, suffer from a little imposter syndrome. Like, Oh my God, what am I doing here? I'm not that good. I don't really belong here. So getting us out of that mindset, clearing our head is probably one of the biggest jobs that a coach has to get you to that proper state of mind. So you can achieve, right, the state of flow, the state of flow where you're just like, you're just in the moment and surgery just happens and it's just, it's so beautiful. And that's what we enjoy the most. So I think coaches can help with that. And sometimes getting in the right mindset for a coach means they have to teach you how to compartmentalize. If you think, take a step back and think, all of us are going through issues like health issues, personal issues, relationship issues, family issues, our kid issues, business stuff, practice. It's all. But when we're doing that surgery, everything has to be about that one surgery. We have to compartmentalize. So for that next 10 minutes, you're focusing on that patient, that surgery in your operating room, and that is it. And that's a skill that's learned. And at the beginning, I wasn't that good at compartmentalizing, but I'm really good at it now. So even now, in our conversation, I'm compartmentalizing that I had a beautiful mountain bike ride this morning. Oh, God, fell off my bike. Oh, no. Fell. Oh, oh, no. Oh, it's... <laughs> but I can focus on the task at hand. Yeah, your hands are okay? Hands are good. I'll be doing a lot of surgery. Do not worry. Oh, but, my gosh. So. Yeah. Yeah, so it's almost that you get to a point in your physical preparedness that you've, you know, you can still get better there too, but the mental part is something that, you know, a coach would help with and might be one of the keys to the next level maybe. Um, Correct. Of improvement. I think so too. And I guess coaches still help with, you know, you should practice, you need to hone skills, but. And I think a coach can be better than a friend. Because your friends accept you as you are. Ah, but your coach knows you could be much better than you are today. So your coach wants to propel you to be even better and better. Whereas your friends are like, no, you're great, don't worry. And they just they accept you as is. Right. And so ultimately our goal is to be a better version of ourselves. I want to continue every year to be a better surgeon than I was the previous year. And yes, point of diminishing returns, how much can you get up that curve? But it's really, that's the pleasure of it. And it's also important the coaches teach you that sometimes a more important thing than a win is a near win or a, or a near miss. Because that's what gives you the drive and determination. Like, no, I've got to be able to do this. Whereas if, like you play a video game, you play a video game and every single level of the game is so easy. You just hammer up all the levels, you're bored. You went through the whole game, you didn't get much out of it, it wasn't that much fun, and you're bored. But if the levels are just challenging enough where you, you just can't make it through your first time, it takes you some effort and some practice. And the next one is a little bit harder. And then a little bit harder. We enjoy that near miss. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then um, what about like confidence? What do you think, 
you know, I, I think it's hard for people to help learn that themselves, what a coach kind of teaches or sort of hones a certain confidence. And, you know, I feel like whenever you have a bad case, your, your confidence is sinking at that moment. And then whenever your confidence sinks, your performance sinks. So it's kind of like having some sort of tactic to understand that you're falling into that. Yeah. I mean, going into the surgery, if you just finished a case that had a complication or a problem or didn't go as beautifully as you planned, that can certainly affect you mentally. And then you go into it thinking like, instead of thinking of success, you think, let me just not have a complication. Let me just, and you're so focused on that complication, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy for the next case. And there's some times when I've attended residents in the past where the resident had a complication and I'd say, you know, the next case, sit that one out. Go have lunch, clear your mind a little bit. I'll do this next case with the other resident. It's okay. And so when you're learning at the beginning, you have to do that. Now, when you're in practice and you've got a case lined up of 25 cases for the morning, you don't have, you can't just go to lunch and have someone else do it for you. <laughs> so that's where you go back to that compartmentalizing and getting back on the horse and saying, okay, we're going to learn from that case. And the other thing that's very important, I think, always differentiate a mistake from a lesson. Mm -hmm. If you learn from what happened in that case, then that becomes a lesson and not a mistake. And remember, the, the journey we're on is success and failures. They're in the same direction. They're on the same path. So I think that's an important thing, a mistake versus a lesson. And learn from the lesson and say, here's how I can become better. And then more importantly even, is let the patient know there were some challenges, there were complications. But I am here for you. You and I together, I'm gonna to take care of this. We're gonna get you the best vision possible. Don't worry, I'll bring in some other experts. And the patient just wants to know that you have their back. They're not gonna understand Victor's prolapse when you try to explain it to them. They don't get it. But they do understand that you really care and that whatever it takes, you're gonna do it for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and knowing that, you know, when you fail, it's going to happen. Like, I think somebody was once telling me that, uh, you know, that mentality that you're going to be the best, you're never going to fail, works until you fail. <laughs> and then and then it just, then yeah. then it's kind of works the opposite way because then you're like, oh, I'm terrible. But you have to know that even if you're doing everything correctly, one, you know, sometimes you're not going to get the goal you wanted. And, and I think uh, probably a coach in that situation would help you work through that. Um, One of the challenges we have, yeah. our big challenge, unlike sports where you can watch a professional baseball player and if that player bats 390, you're thinking, wow, so batting 400, incredible. You have a basketball player who can sink 90% of free throws. You think that's such an incredible player. Uh, hello, you as a surgeon, you're expected to do 100%. Okay. That's the big challenge here. You're expected to perform it at 100% level, not 90% free throw like the NBA, not 40% hit like in, in, in baseball. You're expected to perform at 100%. So there is a tremendous amount of pressure. So just because people devalue our surgery doesn't mean it's any less valuable. It's an incredibly stressful surgery on people's yeah. most precious sense. Yeah, not only do you have to be 100%, it's like if you miss a basket, you can be sad you lost the game. But <laughs> if you, so that's like why we need coaches more than, you know, once you, like if you're, if you bat 90% in your ophthalmology game, you need a coach to get you out of that. <laughs> out of that rut, exactly. For us, 90% is a rut. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder, you know, what would what happen, happen if, if, if you, you did have... Do you coach, actually? Do you coach people? Like, uh, oh, only through cataractcoach.com. Okay, so you don't... So you I don't have offer like one-on-one -on -one in operating yeah. rooms. And that, that can be challenging because, you know, patients are under very light sedation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes surgeons don't want to hear directly. Yeah. It's, it's challenging. But let me tell you, I've actually asked in the past for other outside surgeons who I very much respect in other parts of the country... Yeah. I will pay your airfare, I'll pay your hotel, please can you come to LA, watch me in the operating room, and then I don't yeah. want a single comp compliment. I want only constructive criticism. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I mean, I think there's a role for coaching on the spot, but then also, you know, coaching outside of the OR to kind of, I wonder what that role would be, you know, like reviewing the cases and then I think the coach would be more like mentally preparing the person, making sure, sure. I don't know, what role would a coach have outside of the OR? Well, like reviewing videos, like on Cataract Coach right, right now, I'd say half or more of the videos, I've had your video on there. Yeah. Half, half or more of the videos are from other surgeons. And oftentimes there's some complications, especially for the younger surgeons, which we do all anonymously. Yeah. And we just, our goal is purely a learning situation. Let's just look back at this case, watch the, the game day footage, if you will. What are the things we could have done differently? What are the lessons we learned? And that's so useful. And I show my own cases like that. Here's a, here's a mistake I made. Here's what I learned from it. And therefore that mistake became a lesson. Right. Yeah, yeah so, so there's, there's the, the physical, physical, like being in the OR, knowing the skills, there's the, you know, reviewing your tapes. And then there's, there's like, like the, the whole, whole mental, mental aspect, aspect of um, somehow getting to the next, next level, level, I guess. Yeah, and then part of that is just some simple things that we learn. Like I always say, you gotta be your own toughest critic. No one's tougher on me than me. I can see, I can show you a case that you'd say, wow, this is a perfect case. And I'd say, no, 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 Here, here's what I could have done better. That Rexus was, yeah, it was five millimeters perfectly round, but at the very end, it looks like a slight widow's peak. You can tell where I started it. I want to make it so good that you can't tell where I even started it. Right. So I'm my own toughest critic, and I think that's helpful. Yeah, and like, you know, trying to keep getting better, like you said. You know, if you're an athlete and you're Serena Williams, well, if she didn't have a coach, maybe she would have won like one game, but then knowing that you could keep pushing right. your limits. So I guess like you might not push your own limits unless someone was telling you, you know, do a harder case. So I think a lot of people right. probably don't have that coach inside them saying, okay, try a little bit, try to chop. Sure. Or try, cause, so they're never gonna reach their peak performance necessarily, maybe. And I think we're doing a disservice to the next generation of young doctors when we throw out the scores of no more US Emily step one score, no more grades in school, for some reason, AOA has been deemed bad. So not even no more AOA honor society. Well, here's the problem with going through life in the pass fail mentality. Show me one patient who says, hey doctor, for my surgery, just do a passable job. <laughs> it's laughable because every patient, rightfully so, is expecting perfection or darn close to it. If it's my eye you're doing surgery on, you better not do just a passable job. I don't want dang near perfection. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I, think I think that's something I just, I just thought of now talking, talking to you. It's just, it's we can all be good, but what is the who? If we didn't, if we had a coach, they'd be pushing us to get better every time, and if, so we don't really do that as surgeons necessarily. We want to be in the safe zone. We're doing great, but we don't really know how good we can be if we're not pushing yourselves pushing, which is uncomfortable and, you know, you'll shake your confidence and then you have to build your confidence up. So that would all be easier if you had a coach there kind of regulating everything. Right. That's, for sure. Yeah. Saying like you should practice this so many hours in the wet lab, then you're ready. And, but we kind of have to do that on our own. Yeah. That's the tough part with it. But I mean, same with working out. If I have a personal trainer with me on the day I'm working out, I will bench press more. Yeah. And they will push me to do even a little bit more. One more rep, you can do it. I barely helped you. The confidence they give, oh my God, you got that. I mean, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, so I feel like that would be important in our field. Um, so you sort of have to do it yourself or be aware that, you know, we're sitting here comfortably not pushing ourselves, which is fine, but you you could be better and you for your patient, for... I mean, do we need to be better than good? I don't know, but. Yeah, listen, I believe in what I learned in kindergarten. And I learned the golden rule in kindergarten. And the golden rule is you do unto others as you have them do unto you. So in that regard, I give the same high level of care and the same surgery to my patients as I would want to receive from my own eyes. 
And there's no room for just a passable job. It has to be pristine work, the best that I'm capable of. And that's super important to me. Yeah, that's, that's a good saying too. <laughs> so you have everything you need to know in life, you learn in kindergarten. Yeah, that's true. I think um, you can also, I was interviewing Bobby Osher for a podcast recently and one of my idols, all time idols, an incredible man. But he says, you know, at his Cincinnati Eye Institute, they do and all complications are reported, all data is reviewed, and they sit and they, they, they basically, they peer review each other privately, confidentially, with the sole purpose of raising the tide for everyone so everyone becomes a better surgeon. And I think more practices kind of can incorporate that. That's a very useful thing to do. Yeah, we were, we were trying, trying to, to do that, that, maybe have like a ground rounds just for our practice. We were thinking about that. Do you work in a private practice? I do. So we have a, I'm a solo practitioner, but I'm a partner in a very large surgery center. Our surgery center has seven operating rooms and like, I don't know, 15, 18,000 cataracts a year. Wow. In the heart of Beverly Hills. So it's a very busy place. Yeah, that's crazy. So Yeah, we're in the middle of nowhere. So we don't have much competition for cataracts. <laughs> we're like booking out three months. Um. But I think, yeah, then, I mean, even I look at the data from surgeons in our surgery center and you can see, because everything's timed. So, and that's another thing is to be your own type of critic. You have to measure things. Right. You have to know your metrics. So when I taught residency, when I'd say, okay, I'd have a sheet on the wall and they have to write down time in the room. When was the timeout done? If they're doing a block, when was the block done? When was the first incision? When are you done with the case? And when are you out of the room? And now you can track, keep track of everything. And lo and behold, you had some residents who could do a case very efficiently. But from the time the patient was in the room to the first incision was like 20 minutes. Or, the, or from the drapes off to out of the room was 12. Like, what are you doing? And so that's an important thing. But if you don't measure it, they'd say, well, no, my cases were average of 18 minutes. Then you're very good. But for a resident, but no, that's not the issue. So I think getting that data is actually very important. Yeah, what is that saying? You can't improve what you can't measure. Exactly. You have to know what you're doing here. So you should keep track of that, what you do for each case and what are those times. And a lot of surgery centers will do that. Our center does that. And we can see which surgeons, you know, are going to be most efficient. And it helps you plan out block time for the week. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, yeah. ultimately, you want that efficiency, not because you care about speed. But we don't want to have wasted movements. We want that beautiful ballet of surgery because that's when things happen the best. We're always looking for that state of flow, right? There's a famous psychologist, Mihail Cheek sent Mihaili. He has this famous thing where he talks about flow and the state of flow, right? And I think that is super important because when you get in that mental mindset for that state of flow, you'll perform better. So Yeah, how do you get there? Well, so, I mean, think of this. The, the safe state of flow, they call it as energized focus, full involvement, enjoyment of that action that's being performed. Some people call it in the zone, right, during surgery. So that you're it just, even challenging cases seem like pretty easy and things just kind of work out well. No wasted movements, procedure becomes efficient. It's like a pleasure and it gives us immense satisfaction. The end gives patients great vision. That's like our ideal. That's what we always want to do. So what the psychologists figured out, they figured out these six factors, basically six factors, that encompass the feeling of flow. One is intense focus and concentration during surgery. That's us. For sure, you are intensely focused. Two is merging of action and awareness seamlessly. You're operating, you just kind of, although you're aware where the capsule is, you're just, but things are just happening beautifully. Three is loss of consciousness, and the focus is on the surgery and on the patient. You're not really, your mind's not wandering somewhere else, you're just in the moment. And then it's, it's a sense of having a ton of control. That's the fourth thing. The fifth is an altered sense of time. You're so focused on the surgery and not the clock that it just seems like it goes about like that. And then the last one is the feeling that the surgery is rewarding to you, the surgeon. And of course, it's rewarding to the patient. And I think that's the neatest thing. That's the whole thing called flow, right? It's Mihaili Chink. Let me say his name one more time. That is... Um, yeah, it's fascinating stuff, isn't it? Yeah, so that's almost what a coach would, coach's goal is to take you 
to that the state level. of flow. Yes. So that the, 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 the psychologist who recently passed away, who described us, he's a Hungarian-American psychologist, was at the University of Chicago. His name is Mihaly Cheek Sent Mihaly. And he's described all these things, and it really makes a world of difference. You're in that state of flow. And then to get that flow experience, he says you have characters like a perfect example because you have immediate feedback, which is one of his things you need. And certainly you get that during surgery. Two is the feeling that the potential to succeed exists, and for sure that's us. And the third is feeling completely engrossed and encompassed by the experience. So this is like a fascinating thing. I made a video of this on Cataract Coach all about state of flow. And it, to me, it's just like amazing because everything he described in this is essentially us. Yeah, I have to look at that because that's a, I think that's an important thing that a coach would help you get to that state, state of, of flow and, and what are the factors that um, play into that. Because that would be, that would, that would be like better than good is the state of flow is kind of like your final goal. It's almost like in the Karate Kid, like. What is Mr. Miyagi trying to get the right. karate kid to do? Right, <laughs> right. for sure. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's, it's kind of like, like you don't really know how to get there. A coach would help you, but you kind of have to figure out these coaching techniques. For sure. And for so sure. that's what I was thinking with this movie is presenting like three to five coaching techniques so that you would could coach yourself to the state of flow maybe. And so I think... I don't know what you think the most important ones are. For me, it's being, being able to, to, to be in the now and compartmentalize. So when I'm doing that case, I'm not thinking about all the other issues I got going on. Because we all do. We all live these crazy, complicated lives with so many moving parts. But when we're doing that surgery, it's just that. That's probably one. And then two is just to kind of, you know, when you're in that moment, to just relax. Don't overthink it. Don't be your own toughest critic. Another one that I've had trouble with in the past is that instinct of denial. You do something, you know something bad just happened. The couch just broke. And you'll say, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. You know. You're just accepting what happens as it happens is a huge part of the game. And this obviously, all this becomes easier and easier. I wish I could tell you, oh, yeah, I was in the state of flow and I was just doing these great cases when I was a resident. But it's not really the case. It's now that we're in practice and we're done tens of thousands of cases under our belt. Now we can channel that energy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I feel like with cataract surgery, I sometimes am almost in there, but it's like my mind is actually not focused there sometimes. I like I almost forget that I'm operating, but my mind is like yeah. on something else. So I have to like bring my mind back. So it's not exactly flow. Yeah. But with the challenging cases, I feel like I'm back towards, you know, when you're first learning cataract where you're sure. like super focused, everything's making you nervous, your confidence is like up and down and you're like not in flow. And so I'm trying to like figure out how, and it's all in the mental because I like, I know I have the skills, but mentally sometimes I'm like, ah. Yeah, as we, as we all are. Yeah, trying to figure out what a coach would kind of just tell you to like go back to your basic skills you have the confident competence so i think it's finding confidence to like get to the next level too but and then it's just it's also one more important thing which is equanimity under duress i was very fortunate to go to med school at usc many years ago and usc at the time was a, it still was a huge trauma center so all med students do trauma surgery. And in the days when I was there in the 90s, this was like gang warfare central. So it was the knife and gun club. The amount of trauma was unbelievable. And there was a professor there, his name was Edward Cornwell. And he would say, equanimity under duress. And no matter what, he would stay absolutely calm. And I think that's an important thing. Now, we're not doing such crazy trauma case with bullet wounds, but I had a case recently where I had to disenclavate an iris claw varicized lens and do a cataract. And I thought, okay, I'll to, to disenclavate, let me get the disenclavation needle, the special instrument designed for that. And I do it and I got one off and I go to the other claw and that needle's pretty sharp. <laughs> Boom, hits the iris, starts to bleed. Calm, calm. I just, I don't want the AC to fill up with blood. 
blocked my view to the cataract. So I just kind of think differently. Okay, you know what? Let's, luckily, I only have two pairs of TZs. Let me pressurize the eye, get the IOP up for a while, let it just let's wait it out, and then use a Sinsky hook instead to disenclimate the other one. But just to stay calm and like, it's okay. Yeah, I think that's very important. Instead of just, because I think there's all these articles written on confidence, like once your confidence gets shaken, you start making bad decisions and then you have poor results. So sure. kind of catching yourself and like taking a step back and and reassessing is, is like a skill that is probably very important. And we get better at this as we get more in our careers. You know, I have a video on cataract coach called, do you get anxious or nervous in the operating room? And I show a day where I do surgery on one of my colleagues, mom and dad, as this ophthalmologist watches live. And I wear a heart rate monitor and my heart rate doesn't get above whatever, 70 or 80. It's just, and those are tough cases, small pupil, flow max for the dad, dense cataract, I mean, the works. But I was just like, I'm able at this point to be completely calm and focused on the task at hand and not let that bother That's me. That's, that's really amazing. That's, that's hard to do because, because my heart rate goes, I was looking at, you know, Will Hoff method, the guy who jumps in ice baths. Sure. He says like that's taught him to control his heart rate. Yeah. Like mentally you can actually control your heart rate, which seems almost impossible, but. Yeah. With some, with some breath holding things, you can actually you can certainly slow your heart down with, yeah. with Valsalva breath holding for sure. So you, you feel like you can do it when you're when you get nervous. I don't necessarily do any techniques. I just know that I can mentally just not get wound up. Nervous. Maybe right. you don't get nervous, yeah. I mean maybe. Maybe there's something there too. But I used to do when they used to have these, I'd do all the live surgery events. And so I like for B and L especially, I did live surgery events in like twenty countries. At all the big meetings. I've been live surgery at the academy at ASCRS and the works. So I'm comfortable doing a live surgery. While a thousand of my colleagues watch. I wonder why, how do you do that? <laughs> Cause that's hard. It must be something mentally you can turn off or. Maybe or, just a little, maybe. either naive or stupid. Maybe one, one of those. <laughs> or maybe you're just so confident in your skill. No, because I, listen, there's no such thing as perfect. When you watch a live surgery event, it's like watching a car race, you know, you wouldn't mind seeing an accident or two, as long as no one gets seriously hurt. Yeah. You want a little sure. excitement there. So it's like when you watch the live surgery, like you got to be very cautious. And it's tougher than you think because you actually have two, two ear, ear pieces in. One is a moderator telling you like, oh, ask you questions about the surgery and you're interacting. And the other is actually the director saying, move your hand. I need to get an angle, you know, center of the eye, that kind of thing. I'm not joking. It's tough. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That's the next level. Um. And another question for you in general was, now that you're at this level, um, how would a coach help you, you think? Like if you actually had... I have so much to learn, so much to learn. Do you know why I'm making cataract coach videos? That's how I learn. And always these new techniques keep coming out. Do you know how I learned how to do DMEC? I watched videos. There's, there's a guy, Veldman, University of Chicago, brilliant guy. And I saw a bunch of his little clips online of how to deal with the, the fold, different folder configuration of the graft. And I asked him, I said, can I put all of them together and make a cataract coach video out of it? And he's like, sure. So Peter sent me all those videos. I put it together and I watched that like 50 times. And then the next day after, after watching that many times is when I did the very first one with one of my residents. We're doing our first DMEC. And then it got better and better. And like, okay. And then I, e and then I emailed other, I want coaching. I emailed Martin Dierseimer from Austria. Brilliant surgeon for DMEC, the godfather. I said, can you send me a video of what you do? Put that on camera. I coached, watched it a million times, got the groove of it, asked him a few more questions. Let me understand this. So I want to learn. Yeah, I, I know Peter Veldman. He went to Mass INE around when I was there. He was really nice. Um, but what about aside from like physical skills? Like how would a coach, like, cause like Serena Williams' coach isn't gonna be teaching her skills necessarily, right? Cause he's not as good as her. But you can refine the skills that you have. Refine. Like when I, when I used to attend residents, I did it for 22 years, retired just a few months ago, last year. For senior residents, certainly the second half of senior year, 
I'm going to sit right next to you. I may not even scrub. But I will say, like, center of the eye. Oh, they didn't realize. Don't distort the incision. Your, your chopper's pushing on the, on the para. So I can say things that they're doing and not really realizing because they're focusing on, like, where the tip of the instrument is as opposed to is it pivoting correctly in the, instrument, in the incision. So I think having someone from the outside watch your case is actually pretty helpful, too. And then just having the willingness. I want to learn. You know what the big tell is? Ask surgeons. Do you record your videos as you operate? Oh, I never record them. Why would you not watch game day footage? Now, mind you, I'll use the same memory stick and record over, you know, over and over again. So I'm not saving thousands of videos. But I may have the last 20 or 30 or 50 cases. And, and I, I'll finish an OR day and say, you know what? I definitely want to watch that one case again. And so I'll pull that video out. Let me go and study it. I want to, I have a drive. I want to be a better and better surgeon. Yeah, definitely watching game day video. I like doing that. It's kind of fun. You go home and you're like, can't wait to watch my video. And um, you learn from it. So, you know, that was good, but I probably could do this differently next time. Yeah. And then there's some you're like, delete right away <laughs> after I watch it. <laughs> no. But yeah, so I think a, for, like, for someone like you, a coach who, who could help like look at video and I'm trying to figure out how else a coach might help someone like who's already at your level. Like, well, I mean, again, there's still things to keep learning. I mean, are there newer techniques to keep going? I just posted it. It's going to be coming up soon. I, I do cataract videos well in advance. Um, but there's, there's a, a Yamani one where this surgeon just in order to, he shows me his exact measurements to avoid that issue where you sent me a video that I featured where you resented it by shortening up one haptic. Well, this guy just measures everything. So he's like, I always measure from the tip of the haptic 1.5 millimeters, only cauterize that much. Not just, I don't just guess it. And on the markings he makes and the, he, like, the guy's very mathematical, very precise. Like he's doing the carpentry exact measurements. It's like, oh, I learned from that. Yeah, that's actually, that's the smart. Um, yeah, so there's like the, there's the physical things that you can get better at and, and then I guess it's the, men, a coach would help you get from the mental state to the flow state. Right, and then I have hundreds of videos of me operating online. Of the 1,700 and something cataract coach videos that are online, I don't know, maybe like 700 of me operating. Very easy to, for outside people to, to armchair quarterback my cases. And you know what? I'll read the comments. I want to learn. Teach me. What should I do better? Yeah, so a coach is, plays that role. Um, does there any other role a coach plays, you think, like in a professional athlete's career that would be helpful in ophthalmology? Other than like learning new techniques and keeping them fit. I guess it's like, I think it's the mental aspect probably. Yeah, like you were saying, to getting your head in the game. Yeah. And do we need that as ophthalmologists other than the compartmentalizing? Like, If we accept that surgery is not just a commodity that has very low value, but rather it's a beautiful art that's going to affect the way someone sees the world every waking moment for the rest of his or her life, then that's something that's very valuable. It's worth improving on. It's worth being the best we possibly can be. But if you say, nah, it ain't worth anything. Here, let me cut your fees again. Let me hear. I don't want to. Okay, as you wish. So we have to treat it with the value that it actually brings. We have to treat catastrophe with the value commensurate to what it offers our patients in their lives. Yeah, it's amazing. It's like worth way much more than like an athlete in sports. But Right. Yeah. Wild stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. So it's basically like, how do you get to excellent and how do you get to that next level? And, um, I mean, the key is, I don't think it's re it's possible. I don't think it's possible for most ophthalmologists to hire a coach. First, we're not going to have enough coaches to go around because only a few of them. I mean, I'd love to have Tom Oding come watch me in the operating room and, you know, put an earpiece in my ear and have him say, no, do this, do that. Do that. I would love it but it's not practical for him to go to every practice in America. So at the end of the day, we have to be our own toughest critics. 
And I think that's one thing that I really espoused. I got to be my own toughest critic. And that helps me get better every single case or every week. And then also the idea that, listen, it's compounded. If I get, if I get 1% better a week, that's amazing. You know, in a year, that's 1.01 to the power of 52. That's pretty good. That's really good. Right? And to do that over the course of many years, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's important. And then one last thing is, what is... How do you think a mentor is different from a coach? Or is it very similar? Because like... I think, so in surgery, which is more of a physical thing you're performing, I think you need a coach. You can be your mentor as well, but they have to actually coach you specifically for a, a physical performance. A, 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 you know, they've got to coach you for basically a dexterity contest. You versus the cataract or you versus the eye. Whereas a mentor can teach you other things that are maybe not necessarily related to that physical act of surgery. He's my mentor in business, how to run the practice, how to do this, maybe in research projects. But I think for me, my first love, my love of ophthalmology is surgery. My practice is Devgen Eye Surgery. It's in the title. I like surgery. And that's what I want to focus my entire life on. I never claim to be a great businessman. But I want to be the best surgeon possible. And that's important to me. Wow, that was great. Thank you, Dr. Bozog, for a great discussion. I trust that you learned some very valuable pearls that are going to help you become a better surgeon. We're all committing to being lifelong learners in ophthalmology. And we want to be better at teaching each other, learning from each other, and maybe even coaching each other. Also remember, check out our podcast directly on Spotify, Amazon, Apple, Google, anywhere else you find your podcast. Plus, of course, we'll have it on cataractcoach.com, and of course, you can watch the whole video on YouTube. Until next time, see you later.